From South Carolina Public Radio, this is Walter Edgar's Journal. I'm Walter Edgar, welcoming you to our podcast series about South Carolina culture and history with a nod to all things Southern. Today, Alfred Turner and I will be talking with Katherine Reynolds Chaddock about her book, The Spring Arm Brothers, White Privilege, Jewish Heritage, and the Struggle for Racial Equality. In the late 19th century, Joel and Arthur Springarn grew up in New York City as brothers with very different personalities, interests, and professional goals. Yet together, they would become essential leaders in the struggle for racial justice and equality, serving as presidents of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, exposing inequities, overseeing key court cases, and lobbying presidents from Theodore Roosevelt to John F. Kennedy. In her book, Catherine Reynolds Chaddock sheds new light on the story of these fascinating brothers and explores how their Jewish heritage and experience as second-generation immigrants led to their fight for racial equality. Catherine, welcome back to the studio after a few years. And we're going to be talking about your latest book. Is your third or fourth? It is my fourth biography, okay. and um, I think probably my last. And the title is? The Spingarn Brothers. And, of course, there's a subtitle, <laughs> which is White Privilege, Jewish Heritage, and the Struggle for racial equality. Is it required to have subtitles these days? Because it seems particularly with things that are academic in nature, or just about any book that's not fiction, you have to have a subtitle. I think that's true. I think in especially in nonfiction, and I think it's getting there in fiction, in, in fact, mm. to subtitle things. Uh, let the reader know what they're get coming up it, against. It's helping to attract attention. Ah. If you didn't know who the Spingarn brothers were, sure. But white privilege, Jewish heritage, racial equality, mm. those are real grabbers today. Yeah. And probably <laughs> grabbers for three different types of readers. So <laughs> you you say these three things and you get, you know, uh, more readers than if you just said one thing. All right, Catherine, you you officially are Professor Emerita of in the College of Education at the University of South Carolina, and you taught education administration, but everything you have written has been historical, and that's how we first came into contact, because you were the second reader on some dissertations in the history department at Carolina. Right, right. I, uh, I kind of specialized in the history of higher education when I was at the University of South Carolina, as well as in politics and policies of higher education. So I enjoyed history in terms of the writing more than writing about anything else. I enjoy history. I enjoy going to archives and researching things and, and, and so forth. So it, it's, it's a good place to be as a faculty member and even as an emerita faculty member. All right. Your other books were more or less related to South Carolina. My, right. fa my favorite, Richard Greener, the first African-American graduate of Harvard, the first African-American professor at the University of South Carolina. But how did you come on the Spingarn Brothers? Well, it's a good question because this book is, although it's historical, it's a little less related to higher education than the others about higher educators and a little less related to other other things I'd written about before, which usually was one person at a time. I stumbled across one of the brothers, Joel Spingard, when I was writing a book about a gentleman named John Erskine. And John Erskine had been a professor at Columbia University, as well as a well-known author and concert pianist who eventually became the first president of Juilliard. John Erskine was for a while a colleague of Joel Spingarn. And during that time, Joel Spingarn had some crazy, difficult years at Columbia before he finally got fired. And John Erskine always had something to say about that. So I was 
doing this thing in John Erskine years ago, and I, you know, I started thinking about next steps and so forth, and I remembered the, these comments about this guy, Joel Spingarn, didn't know much else about him. Then when I delved a little bit more into him and realized, wait a minute, he's got this brother, Arthur Spingarn. They did amazing things. They were different, but amazing together uh, and amazingly different. I could do a dual biography. And that's how it all happened. What, what about when was Joel Spingarn at Columbia? He, of course, he got his Ph.D. at Columbia and finished that in about 1901. He immediately became a tutor for one of his favorite professors there and stayed until about 1911. Mm-hmm. So he was there in the early 1900s. And he did have a professorship which he lost. Right. He worked his way up in literary criticism. And there was a department of literature and literary criticism. And while he was working his way up, a couple of his best professor buddies resigned. Everybody was getting a little unnerved about the fact that Nicholas Murray Butler had become the president and was making some changes, and the changes weren't good for literature. They weren't good for music. They they were you know, more in the direction of professional schools and so forth. So Joel Spingarn didn't like that at all, and he let them know it. <laughs> and he let them know it in and, every and he kind was, of way. And he was also in a position to do that. Uh, I mean, he didn't depend upon this professorship for his livelihood because he came from inherited wealth. He especially married wealth. He married in 1906 a lady named Amy Einstein, whose father was a very, very wealthy woolen merchant. And so that was highly helpful. He also, his father was an immigrant to this country in 1848, but had made a lot of money in tobacco and selling tobacco, rolling tobacco, doing everything with tobacco, and it became more money as soon as cigarettes got popular. They were in New York, of course, and um, yes, he had a lot of interests too, besides his interest in being a professor. But he also had the disadvantage, this is the time right around World War I when the Ivy Leagues are deciding there are too many Jewish students around and began actively to limit the number of Jew- Jewish students. Ironically, now when we're talking about opening all the world, they were very careful in making sure that not too many Jewish students got admitted to the Ivies. Uh, and here was this outspoken professor at an Ivy League school who just happened to be Jewish. And as you point out in that chapter of leaving Columbia, his colleagues said very definitely the fact that he was Jewish played a role in his dismissal. They, at the very least, said it didn't help that he was Jewish. His ultimate dismissal was over an incident that he commented on at another professor who got in the press for some some crazy personal things. And, and Joel commented on the fact that that professor who got fired was nevertheless a good colleague, a good teacher, a good professor, et cetera. In other words, he didn't really defend him, but he wanted it to be known that, hey, this guy has been fired, but he did good things for the universe. Well, that was the final straw for President Butler at Columbia, possibly the straw he was looking for with this Jewish faculty member. And I think they had about two other Jewish faculty members at the time, So it didn't help. And this was in about 1911, and it wasn't many years later that they very publicly limited the the number of Jewish students. I have to ask a question now. This is something, you know, in light of recent rulings about uh, how colleges attract uh, people, more diverse students, you know, how can they do that legally uh, in light of recent court rulings? And here, here we are, they're basically saying, nope, we want to limit diversity. Uh, how did they publicly handle this? Or did they just do it and not worry about the fallout? I think they just did it and not worried about the fallout. And also, I mean, I think they're, they're, they did it 
in a way that it satisfied their very, you know, Episcopalian, non-Jewish ah. board of directors and, and so forth. This was true throughout the Ivy League. Professor Marcia Sonata at the University of South Carolina has studied the whole question of Jewish admissions pre-World War II and the fact that the Ivy Leagues just basically said, we don't want too many of them here. Wow. Yeah, it was not of... no None, but not too, wow. not too many. Keep a lid on it, well, and, so to speak. And a little bit earlier, it had been Catholics, so... Mm. And yeah, oh, gee, we've got Lionel Trilling here. We don't need Joel Spingarn, you know, that kind of thing. And Mm. and it was sort of agreed upon. I'm not sure talked about that much in, say, board of directors meetings or whatever. But everybody at the top, including Nicholas Murray Butler, the president, seemed to agree on this even before it was formally decided to limit the number of Jewish students and so forth. Okay, and I want to billboard something here to our listeners. We're getting to the fact that not only Joel, but his brother Arthur, obviously having experienced some discrimination themselves, moved to help others who were being discriminated against, and that might just get us into South Carolina and the South. Just a hint. Carry on. (laughs) Well... It does give a hint, but it'll take us a while. It'll to, take a while. It'll to take get a there. while to get to, to South Carolina. Sure. Let's do mention Arthur, the other brother. We we focused on the academic, but the other brother who became a very successful corporate lawyer. He did. He graduated from Columbia mm-hmm. Law School before there was any notion that you know maybe that there would be too many Jewish students, and he immediately got a job. It was a little too corporate for him, his first job. He, um, you know, he didn't want to keep reorganizing railroads, as he said, <laughs> and so forth. So he, he got another law firm job with a partner that he really, really liked and appreciated that dealt more with people. You know, ultimately, he's one that dealt with the problems among a lot of a lot of well-known financial folks, a lot of well-known people in literary areas and so forth. And so he enjoyed the people law work, you know, one at a time. You got a problem, I'll deal with you. Not the corporate so much, but he did very, very well in his law practice. But as young adults and professionals, these two men began to notice discrimination in and around New York City, uh, unfairness. Uh, So you want to talk about some of that? Well, Arthur, especially for some reason, decided in and around New York to take it on his own. When he was at a bar and he saw discrimination, this is in the very early 1900s, discrimination about a black person also at the bar, but he would see them getting charged more for their drink, actually. And so Arthur would take his glass and slam it on the table and break it and decide, oh, they'll have to pay for, for my glass breaking. That that serves them right. And it it's interesting because here they were, Joel and Arthur, in the white majority, but in a discriminated minority. So they were sort of in in both worlds. You could go either way in both worlds. And they decided ultimately to go the way of noticing discrimination against the blacks because that was noticeable. Joel sometimes took them to theaters and then made a fuss when they didn't get the good seats and got the bad seats because they were black and so forth. So they they started um, their sort of a little bit of a personal trip against racial discrimination in in these smaller ways. And from there, it grew. How did they get involved with the formation of what would become the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People? That's a very good question. I'm sure they noticed that there was something like that going on. There had been something called the Constitutional League. There had been the Niagara Society. And then from there, it grew at about 1910 into NAACP with people like John Dewey, Jane Addams, et cetera, et cetera. They 
actually got involved after it was a couple of months old, the NAACP. And there was a sort of a call or a fundraising for a, a gentleman who had been discriminated against, a sharecropper who was being treated unfairly and got put in jail because he railed against it, et cetera, et cetera. Joel contributed money. And right there, they noticed. And I think it was substantial money, like about $500, which would have been a lot in those days. So, of course, he got a call from or, or a visit from uh, Moorfield Story, who was the head of the NAACP at that time, saying, oh, would you like to be involved with us? <laughs> you know, you have, you have given money. You must care. And we like the people who have money, et cetera. And he said, sure, and got involved right away. And, you know, it, right away, his involvement made him realize there's a lot of legal stuff going on. Oh, Arthur, my brother, he could he could do some legal work, too, for the NAACP, this new organization. The NAACP, in its founding, it faces a division within the black community. Up until this point, the uplift of the African-American community was modeled on the Booker T. Washington training method. Uh, let's just train the young boys and girls in the trades. The other group, W.E.B. Du Bois and those associated with NAACP was, no, we're not just going to do that. We're going to train the whole person. The sky should be the limit. Want to be a lawyer, want to be a doctor. That's going to be where we're going to focus. We're not going to keep our place, which pretty much was the Booker T. Washington motto. Yes. And, you know, it truly was about opportunity and justice, not so much about what job they would get, but that they would have an opportunity to raise themselves into any employment or any education that they could do and wanted to do. And it, it was interesting because they stayed out of the economic thing, a thing about, oh, you should pay them more. We should da 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 because the National Urban League was doing that, and they had just started at about the exact same time as NAACP. So the two organizations had very, you know, specific things they were doing, and that was good. It was it was organized. But for, for the NAACP, it was truly about opportunity and justice. And how could you have equal opportunity if you couldn't get an equal job, an equal education, live in an equal neighborhood, equally vote, et cetera? And it went from writing checks to very quickly the leadership of the organization. Right, right. Joel quickly became the head of, of their board of directors. He was a busy guy. At the same time, he managed to get married, bought a huge estate in Amenia, Dutchess County, New York, had his townhouse in New York City, but went back and forth. And he even, in 1908, he ran for U.S. Congress, unsuccessfully, but at least he ran. As a progressive Republican. <laughs> yes, yes, very much in the, in the um, Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt mode. Yeah, although um, they had a falling out with Teddy Roosevelt over the Galveston affair. That, and really over the progressive party that Teddy Roosevelt started as a party and in 1912 had a meeting to formally nominate Teddy Roosevelt and any other progressives on the national scene. At that time, there was a lot of heat about seating blacks in the party. This, this convention was in Chicago. And Joel went, went to it. Arthur did not. He was never quite as political. Joel went to it and said, so let's seat these black delegates. No, mm, well, we got to be careful. We got to da da da. Ultimately, they would they seated the northern black delegates, but not the southern black delegates. And this was the Roosevelt Progressive Party. Ultimately, he also didn't win, and Woodrow Wilson we ended up with. Wow, that's saying a lot right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's South Carolina, Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, well, he was just blocks from here, I guess, where he yeah. grew up. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, as president, Teddy Roosevelt had appointed black South Carolinians to customs as customs collectors, postmasters. Mm -hmm. That he had that kind of thing. 
Yeah. But Woodrow Wilson was of a different stripe. Let's just say that. Uh, yeah. Yes. Woodrow Wilson segregated the federal government. Mm. Which had been nicely integrated before that. No, Woodrow wouldn't have that anymore. Born in Virginia, raised in South Carolina. <laughs> and of course, this creates problems for African Americans, then called persons of color or Negroes. And the NAACP's mission really begins to grow, not necessarily in reaction to, to Wilson, but Wilson represented a whole change in the American landscape, political landscape. Let's just sweep all of this under the rug. What happened has happened. This is the era of good feelings with the blue and the gray and, you know, uh, the Klan's not so bad. <laughs> Birth of a Nation is a great movie. Uh, but it was, a, it was a national phenomenon. Absolutely. And, I mean, we went backwards with, of course, we, we could justify it with separate but equal separate but equal. Really? Really? And then you could make equal as unequal as you want it. So, yeah, there, w there were times of, of seeming to go backwards, for, for sure. And that changed a bit from, from place to place, state to state. Immigration brought many from the South into the cities of the North. In some of those cities, that there was total not welcome. In others, work was available, and, and, and everybody of, of any color, any background could work. And so there was a lot of getting away with things some places, and in other places, maybe getting a chance. Well, that's, of course, the, the Great Migration uh, beginning in the years just before uh, World War I and continuing up through the Great Depression. Back to the brothers. Let's talk some more about them. So... They, of course, had other interests, but the NAACP was their, their interest together. Joel had always been kind of a, a crazy kid, uh, loved to do lots of things, active things. He went up to Kentucky one summer just so he could see a feud all summer long. He uh, walked when he was 15 years old from, from New York to Philadelphia by himself. But he enjoyed that. So he, for the NAACP... While he was chairing the board and eventually became president in uh, 1929, he was speaking all over the country. That was his big thing. He really started a lot of chapters in a lot of places by speaking. And so in 1913, they had about 25 chapters. By 1916, they had 65 chapters. He even started the first um, collegiate chapters. Howard was one of them. Benedict here in South Carolina was one of them, et cetera. And so everybody did what they were good at. Arthur was able to do what he was good at, which was the legal stuff, was very essential. He didn't argue at the Supreme Court himself. Moorfield's story was known as better arguing when they took cases. They took a lot of cases everywhere. And half of his duties were to shift through cases and find ones that might work, might work. His first really enjoyable victory was Donald Gaines Murray, who had been turned away at the law school at University of Maryland as a black, and actually they won that at the Supreme Court. They won some other ones in Texas and elsewhere about voting rights and about residential rights. They'd win them, and then people would still get around them afterwards, and they'd fight the same fight over and over again, of course, many times. So but, you know, Joel also had his family. He had four children, two sons, two daughters, his big estate in Amenia. He was very involved in the community there. He owned a newspaper in Dutchess County, and um, he ran a club for black folks out of mostly out of work, out of money for sure, and so forth, ran a Heart of Hope club, and um, worked a lot at NAACP with W.E.B. Du Bois, who ran the Crisis magazine and the propaganda for NAACP in general. He called it propaganda and did a wonderful job at that. Well, Arthur started collecting books and plays and musical scores and everything by African Americans. And he wrote reviews of every book 
by an African American at the time for the crisis. About he was writing about a hundred reviews a year. Joel continued with his poetry and things he had done with literature when he was at Columbia. So they they both had this meeting of the minds about NAACP, but very different lives. Arthur didn't marry till he was 40, and he never had children. They had different lives, but they came together around NAACP. Joel was never very healthy. He did make it to one year at World War II, and, you know, they kind of let him have a small officer position because he wanted to go to France badly. Um, When he came back, he was truly never well. But he managed a titular job as president of NAACP for about about 10 years, about 1929 to, to 1939. After that, hey, who steps in as the next president but Arthur? <laughs> and, and Arthur was almost 40 years? Yeah. He was president until he was in his 70s of the end of, until 1966. You know, he's amazing, and he lived a long life compared to Joel, who died at 55. All right. You, you mentioned the collections, and I, I want to talk about that because the Swingarn Collection at Howard is one of the great troves of African Americana in the world. Photographs, articles, newspapers, everything. Written autobiographies, especially he was interested in what was happening in Haiti and had been interested in what was happening in the Canal Zone. But really, um, you know, he collected things from uh, musicians, authors, poets, et cetera, from all over the world who were black. And what a collection. 5,000 items went to Howard in 1948. Then there's a medal that's given annually by the NAACP. Yes, I had an interesting experience with this book and that medal. There is the Spingarn Medal. Joel began it in 1913, rather early. And then when he died, he put in his will that it would continue, put money for it in there, et cetera, et cetera. When I wrote the epilogue to the book, I mentioned who had won it over time, not every single person, but I just said, and for instance, during the uh, 20th century, so 21st century, so and so and so and so and so and so and so. And then I sent the book to the to the publisher, Johns Hopkins Press. And about two weeks later, our own congressman won the Spingarn Medal. James Clyburn. James Clyburn. And I guess that was only about four months ago, five months ago now. And uh, so I called them. I said, you've got to. Where I mentioned the more recent winners, you've got to add James Clyburn. You just have to. They did it. They managed it. Well, and among the other 20th century, uh, Sidney Poitier, Julian Bond, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, But I think one of the earlier winners was William Just, was he not? Yes. You know, so it's limited to no one, I mean, in terms of what people do. It's it's an accomplishment. It has nothing to do with whether you're an actor or writer or politician or whatever. Scientists, lots of scientists, physicists, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that medal goes on and on. Actually, also going on and on, Arthur left a large legacy to Columbia for scholarships and so forth. And I think he left uh, over $100,000 that has grown. It allows Columbia to— But it was for scholarships only for African Americans? Uh, Yes. Now, I was intrigued with the way you open the book, your first two sentences— Spring Arn High School in Washington, D.C. was built in 1952 as a colored school in a colored neighborhood in recognition of the long-standing separate but equal legal doctrine. But it wasn't just another segregated school. Its imposing three-story red brick building, 225,000 square feet, that's a nice footnote, graced a sprawling lawn and housed programs from home economics and woodworking to college preparatory academics. Its scale of opening drew black luminaries such as Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, and John Hope Franklin. Now, what an ironic twist, as you say, that two men who had labored uh, with the NAACP, this is a segregated school, 1952, in a segregated Washington, D.C. Right, right. 
uh, excellent school when it started, too. And as you said, it attracted people who had fought for the black cause to its opening and so forth. It reminded me a little bit of the World War II discussion about training blacks. And Joel finally said, okay, they refused to train black officers in white camps with white officers, but that shouldn't mean blacks don't go. Let's get our own black officer training, which they did in Des Moines, Iowa, and, you know, better than nothing. And I think that's what they said. If we can have an excellent, excellent, excellent school, it's better than nothing. And of course, years later, it turned out eventually it, it died, the school. But let's be clear, it, it didn't die because it didn't carry out its mission in the early days, right? It, yeah. it died because of the changes, the social forces that changed not only society, but also the laws, correct? Right. Yeah. Yes. In many ways, it was a victim of desegregation. Right. Yeah. Sure. You mentioned, Arthur, talking about we get our own black program, we get the best that we can. That's a very conservative approach. And uh, by the 1950s, the African-American community is beginning to look to other organizations because it's not necessarily his leadership, but he reflects a very conservative approach to the civil rights movement compared with CORE, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and younger African-Americans who wanted to push street demonstrations. He was not very wild about... No. The militancy was not for Arthur, who was still around at that time. Of course, Joel had had died already. But no, the level of militancy was not something Arthur liked seeing. But I will say that what I found from him was he did manage to say... I guess it has taken so long for good things to happen that I can understand why people band together and get militant. And then he also said, well, I guess we lit the torch and now they're carrying it, which I, I loved that expression for the These are the, the people at the lunch counters and, and the sit-ins and, and, and the marches and so forth. Wasn't really fascinated with that as a way, but had to admit other ways were slow in working. Okay. Well, and of course, the NAACP was involved in the desegregation cases in the 1950s in South Carolina, uh, Briggs v. Elliott, which of course became uh, the signature case in the Brown decision. Yes. And, and, and for sure, Thurgood Marshall who was very involved in the NAACP and, and especially the legal things at the NAACP, was carrying the torch for those things that, that managed to happen, and especially Brown versus Board of Education. All right. Well, Catherine, any last words for our listeners before we sign off today? Just thank you for your attention and listening and getting what you can out of this discussion, because I think discussions like these, very important discussions. Thank you for listening. Okay. All right. Well, Catherine Chaddock, the author of The Spingarn Brothers, White Privilege, Jewish Heritage, and the Struggle for Racial Equality. Thanks for being with us today on The Journal. Catherine Reynolds Chaddock's book about the Spring Arm Brothers tells a story that many today might see as unlikely. Two Jewish brothers in New York, privileged in some ways but considered the other by many in society, find common cause with African Americans suffering from racial discrimination. And Joel and Arthur Springarn became leaders in the struggle for racial equality. Their work is an important part of the history of social justice in this country and is a part of South Carolina history. Walter Edgar's Journal is a production of South Carolina Public Radio. I'm Alfred Turner, and I produce the show, which is made possible by listener contributions to the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. Remember, the views and opinions expressed on Walter Edgar's Journal are not necessarily those of South Carolina Public Radio or its underwriters. 
New episodes of Walter Edgar's Journal are published on the first and third Fridays of the month and are available at SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org on the SCE TV app, as well as your favorite podcast provider. We'll talk again soon.